Great, everyone is having a great morning. Uh, my name is Lawrence Ganzi, and I uh, currently serve as the Student Government Association President. Uh, it is my esteemed honor this morning to present uh, our Ruben L. Speaks Endowed Memorial Lecture Series speaker. Uh, she may not know this, but uh, I've seen so much about her from Reverend Dominique uh, Robinson. So I'm very uh, excited to uh, hear all that she will pour into us this morning. Uh, I do want to just take a moment to introduce uh, our speaker, which is the Reverend Dr. Teresa L. Fry Brown. She is the Bandy Professor of Preaching, a chaired professorship created in 1986 with a gift from B. Jackson Bandy that is considered by many to be the country's premier chair in homiletics. Uh, she has taught at Candler uh, since 1994, and in 2010, she became the first African-American woman to attain the rank of full professor. She also served as the director of Candler's Black Church Studies program until 2015. Some of her research in, uh, interests include homiletics, womanism, womanist ethics, sociocultural transformation, and African diaspora history, focusing on African-American spiritual values. In addition to five monographs and four books, uh, Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown has written articles and chapters for over a dozen more. And that list uh, is... Um, voice, body, and animation and proclamation. Can a sister get a little help, advice, and encouragement for Black women in ministry and weary thoughts and new song, Black women proclaiming God's word. Uh, Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown is a former speech pathologist uh, and an, or, an ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and currently serves as the denomination's historiographer, executive director of research and scholarship, and editor of the AME Review. She also serves as the vice chair of the AME General Officers Council and convened the inaugural AME Scholars Convocation in 2018. She is a member of several scholarly guilds, including the Society for the Study of Black Religion, the Academy of Homiletics, where she currently serves as second vice president, and the American Academy of Religion, where she is the co-chair on the Womenist Approaches to Society and Religion Group. So at this time, I present uh, to all of us our uh, lecture series speaker for this morning, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. Good morning to everyone, and thank you, Reverend Gans, see, I think it's Reverend, right, for the introduction. Um, the introduction, for that, that was a couple of years ago, so God has blessed me to do some other things now, but I thank you for your kindness this morning. Last night, we talked about fatigue and the voice. I'm sorry. Oh. I thought someone was saying something, I'm sorry. Last night we talked a lot about fatigue and what to do when we're in those seasons. This morning, I'd like to talk about um, prophetic preaching, uh, something that we should be called on to do regularly, but sometimes people shy away from it because they think it means that you're angry all the time. But it doesn't mean you're angry all the time. So I want to talk about borrowing from Marvin McMichael's title, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? Prophetic and Transformational Voice. What does it mean to have a voice, uh, whether one is inside the pulpit or outside of the pulpit, whether one is witnessing or teaching or lecturing or just having conversation with someone that may have a different thought about something? What does it mean for us to speak life? In situations. And so this is one of my very favorite uh, quotes from uh, Oscar Romero. Uh, a church that doesn't provoke any crisis, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is this? Those preachers, and I might say proclaimers and witnesses, who avoid every thorny matter so it won't be fast or is not to have conflicts and difficulties, do not light up the world in which they are in. And, and so it's, it's, it's about getting in contact uh, to, 
to not just sitting around talking about what's wrong with the world, but what am I doing about it? How am I speaking? How am I moving? How am I acting toward impacting some kind, some sense of change, some sense of newness and giving life affirming words? I think that when we began to talk about this transformative word, sometimes people, because they're on the internet, there are all these prophets that sometimes name themselves. But I used to say to my students that prophets die. So one has to be careful when one wants to call oneself a prophet because you're going to go against the grain uh, that you become a spokesperson for God, but you're standing on behalf of a community to articulate the holy, to articulate a way in which God wants us to live. It's the Hegelian, this is the problem, this is what we're doing, this is what God wants us to do, and this is how we're getting there. That's what transformative speech is about. This is in, This is where we're going, it's where we're going. And so we talk in terms of emancipatory praxis from Caesar Clark, which is the response, the ultimate response to God is how we inform, engage, and point out contradictions in the world, the contradictions in the world, the contradictions in the world. And, and I want us to stress that because transforming means that we change a structure or the outward appearance or form, we change the character condition. It's a metamorphosis, it's transmuting, it's, it's leaving what was, what, is the, what does the biblical text say? Leaving what is behind and reaching for things that are ahead. But we have to recognize where we are in order to do the change. We just can't speak it, there's some action that goes with it. De Bono talks about we disrupt old patterns of thinking and allow a new awareness of what can be. So we're not just reading and talking, but we're actually giving some people manageable things to do to transform the world. This engagement means that we have to research and read and reread and evaluate and fact check. We have to, uh, instead of just saying this is the headline and going with it, check sources. Uh, I talk with preachers all the time that will hear something and they automatically write a sermon about it. Maybe they need to let that settle for a bit so they get the real facts about what it is. It means to challenge the status quo, to acknowledge we have a need to change and to raise consciousness. And sometimes it's our own consciousness that needs to be raised. It's to admit and accept our own faults and our complicity in what's going on. We do a lot of transference. I'm looking at all these political ads that are going on now. There's a lot of challenging and, and transference. And I, I always wanna think, but what is my part in that? How have I stepped back and allowed something to happen? When did I keep quiet? Um, Audre Lorde says that we need to speak because we were never meant to survive. That there's no safety in silence. So when am I so quiet that I just let things keep rolling and never even try to go and say, what is this? Why are we doing this? One has to believe that not only can I change, but that other people can change. That, that, that we have a voice that we need to use, that we have to name ourselves. And that transformative preaching is about the valuing of humanity and not how loud we're talking. It is not always railing against everything. It is, what is it that we can do together? That I can hold myself and hold individuals near and far as God's loved ones, that we all need to do some modification of what we, we do. Uh, the late Samuel Proctor says, we have to recognize God even in the midst of the worst situations. And that's difficult, I know that. But recognize God even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. In my work in transformation over the years, there, there are some steps that I think that we go through in order to just not name something that's going on, we have to be aware of what it is. Put the proper name on whatever it is that's going on. That's the awareness. Then the analysis is what I was talking about where we, we research, but we also risk finding out more information. I thrive on information and knowledge, but there's also a risk with that because sometimes it kind of throws you off kilter when you start getting all awash in all this information. And, and, and that was something that we went through during COVID where things just kept coming, 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 and it was difficult to sort it out. But we have to do an analysis of something and not take anything at face value. That's superficial preaching. We have to, we have to dig deep in like you do a text so you can actually preach more than what you heard somebody else preach, right? So we have to analyze 
what's actually wrong, not who's wrong, but what is wrong. What seems to be going against what we know is the word of God or what our values might be. Then we have to allow a space to grieve for humanity. All these kinds of things going on in the world. I don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm driving and I see something and then a tear starts rolling. Because I think about how disappointed God must be sometime at what we're allowing and what we're doing. But humanity needs to grieve. And preachers need to have a space to grieve too. Because we're supposed to step in and say something affirming to someone. But sometimes our hearts, we become that Jeremiah, that weeping prophet so much that we, 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 we knee jerk to anger instead of knowing that, as I said last night, we have to lament what's going on. In, in, in what's going on. Uh, in my denomination, we've had two women in ministry that were leaders die in the last week. And I think about all the missed opportunities. So I'm grieving for that. And at the same time, I know I need to work so that things can change, okay? Appropriate methods for healing. When we, when we are going to be talking about an issue, uh, action or something, what are the appropriate things that are manageable that we can do? I mentioned some of this last night. What, what are some ways for us to begin the process of healing, understanding that one sermon doesn't solve anything? One action doesn't solve anything. I don't care if everybody falls out in the church that doesn't, doesn't we haven't done what we need to do. A sermon is lifting the veil just a little bit so we can start look, we can start investigating together what's going on but it is not the end of it. Uh, part of the issue that happened in the modern civil rights movement is we thought uh, after we finished singing and marching, everything was gonna be all right. Kendrick Lamar, right. But we looked the other way. We didn't, look, we didn't look deep enough to know that sometimes one step forward means 15 steps backward because it's a power dynamic and people don't want to give up their power but we have to keep pushing forward, even if it's small steps, small step behavior. And then is there something that we can do about the situation? Is there an act? Is there a ritual? Is there an event? Okay, it may not always be rush out the door with signs. Sometimes it's setting with it and trying to think together, how do we get to this place and what can we do to move us one step further? We rush also if we're going to have transformative voices to reconciliation. Uh, this reconciliation word is thrown around a lot. But one of the things that we miss in the biblical text, reconciliation is a process where God changes human beings and adjusts to God's standard. When we are working with each other, forgiveness must be requested and granted sentence has to take place. There's new ways of doing things. There's a period of pruning and pruning hurts. Someone asked me last night about change. Pruning hurts. Change hurts. Healing can begin, but you have to go through some pain to get to the healing. And not everybody is going to get to the other side, which is really frightening. Reconciliation is a continual spirit work. So when we, we, we voice the actualization of God's promise being restored, we have to know that it has to keep going and it must be maintained. So we have to be honest about the injury that has taken place with each party, not just me, but the other people too, right? We have to have sincere regrets and remorse that there was an injury in the first place. We have to be ready to apologize, not that I'm sorry, but a heartfelt apology for the injury that was inflicted, a readiness for the for the parties not to just let it go, but to understand that there's been some hurt and some bitterness and some anger caused by the conflict, and we have to talk that through. Then a commitment not to repeat, and here's the, here's the piece. What, we are what we're enculturated with is if I just say I'm sorry, that's good, but I have not tried to work not to repeat it. And as Disraeli said, if we're not aware of history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? And so where is the commitment that I'm not gonna do that anymore? Can I see what that's about? That I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to offend you anymore. Uh, redress the grievances. Um, I was talking with Dr. Rampelli from South Africa uh, last week, and she said that what they found with the Truth and Reconciliation 
uh, tribunals that they were having is there was no redress. There was no penalty for people doing, they could come and say, I'm sorry, but it didn't cost them anything to say, I'm sorry. So what is the redress that we're asking here? And then we can end into, enter into some mutuality. When we talk about justice, and I hear people say all the time that, that uh, you can't talk about politics in church. Well, church is a political statement. Let's just be clear. Just saying that I believe something is a statement that somebody else might not have. And so we have to think in terms of the types of justice that are in the biblical text. There's attributive justice where each person is treated as, a, as an individual according to his or her abilities and do. Distributive justice is the rules of fair play that we find in the Old Testament where we protect the poor, we protect the widow. Retributive justice means making right of wrong things. That might be punishment and re rehabilitation. And nobody wants to talk about punishing anybody. But that's in the biblical text. And injustice is a violation of the jubilee. Injustice is an act of violence. It's denying who people are. Simone Veil says any act that depersonalizes or trans a, transforms a person into a thing is injustice. So we talk about social injustice, but it's a really, it's about how an individual is being treated and then how a whole groups, how groups of people can be mistreated. And this does not have a race tag on it, by the way, race being a social construct. It doesn't have an ethnicity on. All of us can be part of an unjust move of an unjust action. And sometimes we act like we can categorize people as they're the cause of injustice. In, in my head, uh, any violence, anything that depersonalizes, Martin Luther King said, thingifies someone is an injustice. We make people worthless and, and not counting. And sometimes we articulate that from the pulpit. We talk a lot about in this transformative action that we do, we talk a lot about speaking truth to power. That's a Quaker term, as you can see right there. It is to speak even if there's some mode of conflict coming at you. It is, it, it's, it's how we find an alternative to violence, which, is, which I find very interesting these days when I'm listening to uh, assessments of people's preaching. They slayed it, they killed it, they tore my pulpit up, all of that, we've talked about love for 45 minutes and now we're using violent language to come on the backside of it because we're in a violent society. So it even comes into the assessment of the work of God. You killed it. No, that wasn't my intent. My intent was to give life affirming word and transformation is about that. So why are you gonna tell me now that I, that I tore everything up? Hmm, just a thought. Just, I just wanted to drop that right there. We'll talk about it a little bit. I see you, uh, Reverend Gansey. Uh, yes. Samuel DeWitt Proctor talked about believing that change is possible. Sometimes we get so jaded because of everything going on around us that we do not believe that things are going to change. We go into that, how long, Lord, are we going to have to know? Nobody knows the trouble I see. We never get to glory, hallelujah. We've just been in this thing so long. Nothing's ever going to happen to change it. When do we believe that God is still alive and doing something that can impact change? Um, so he talks about us being watch people uh, on the sentinels. And we know in the biblical text, it says that we are as watch the watchmen, we are supposed to warn the people. And if we warn the people and they don't do anything, it's on them. But if we don't warn, it's on us. So think about all of the things that we carry as preachers, as proclaimers, that we become cowards and don't warn the people because we think we'll lose an honorarium or we'll lose an invitation instead of actually saying, this is what we need to be doing together because it takes everybody on. We think in terms of this transformative voice using the Afrocentric rhetoric uh, strategy from Asante, that we speak words 
in community, for community deliberation and community discourse, for action to, to, to start being uh, generated, generative. We, we, we have a rhetoric of resistance that's the, in the crucible of struggle, we still try to find words or actions or moves in order for us to do something. There's a rhetoric of affirmation where we, we start talking about people's personhood. I'm always curious as how a people who were bought and sold can then act so impersonal to other people who can articulate negativity about each other. Uh, but this affirmation of personhood is critical to the voice we use when we're proclaiming, quote unquote, the good news. And then a rhetoric of possibility where we, we begin sharing information that yes, this is a situation that's going on. Uh, someone asked me about justice fatigue last night. This is a situation that's going on, but there's a possibility because I believe God is the still moving and doing God, that this can in fact change and be different. And I can articulate that. Because of our ethical grounding of God being active, but, uh, uh, about God valuing everybody, about renewed re relationships through Christ, about uh, moving toward higher standards of behavior, about the way we use our language to create a world, about the belief that the spirit can work through people, even people that we don't think, because we can be very judgmental, can be saved. But if we believe in spirit, and we believe with the biblical text that everybody has something they can be saved from and moved to, right? If we believe in what we say. And how do I identify with the word of God? And, and am I internalizing it? Or when I preach a sermon, am I just preaching it for that moment and I don't intend to live it? It's for those people out there. But I usually say that when, when one constructing this sermon, it is for the preacher first and then for the congregation. So if I'm not committed and convicted by the word, what am I doing when I'm standing there? Because that means that whatever the word as a conduit of God comes through me can't go any further because I'm blocking it. Because I think it's for all those people, all those sinners are going to hell, but I'm good, right? I'm still floating above the water. Cecil Williams, who, who um, was at Glide Memorial, this is a quote that I love from him. The true church stands on the edge of life where real moans and groans are. We talk a lot about marginalization. It means one that is connected with and observes in a pastoral sense what's going on, not just with the people that they pastor or the people that they talk to, but the moans and groans of the world and don't get so comfortable that they don't have to pay attention to life. Right, they have, they go away five weeks, they have 15 sermons, they're gonna preach them no matter what, doesn't matter what happened on the news, doesn't matter what's happening in their lives. They have this set thing because that's another checkoff list and has nothing to do with the liveliness that's inherent in birthing a sermon, in, in keeping it connected with, uh, um, I'm doing, uh, I have a grant project called Compelling Preaching and I did a survey uh, with lay people and clergy in the AME church about what was important to them. And they talked about relevant sermons that were connected to who they are and not just something someone gets up and preaches. Because the people want to know when we finish shouting, how am I going to live the rest of the day? You know, when I finish this meal, I want more than the sugar left over on the corner of my mouth. I need protein to get me through the week. So what is that? And so then we think in terms of transformative voices, then we think in terms of this redemption motif. Uh, when we're looking at text, when we're considering what we're going to do, what are the universalities and particularities of hope? Where is there hope? Is there hope anywhere? What is the godness that's going on? Not the preacher rescuing anybody, but what's the godness in the world that's going on? Where is, where is there uh, non-negotiables that is in the biblical text that we can't change no matter what we're doing. What are, what are non-negotiables in the biblical text? And 
um, am I able when I'm tired, when I'm disgusted to still preach a good news? Okay. Am I able to still preach the good news? I don't want to bore you all, so I'm going to go ahead. When I'm doing this transformative kind of preaching, what is the language that I'm using? Am I using language that's piercing people or that, that is recognizing everybody's humanity? Am I supporting power structures? Uh, and there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with the status quo as long as it's fungible enough that you are still including people. It's like you have to have a tradition or, you don't, or you're rootless, but it can't be so concretized that there's no fluidity. There's no way to change some things. What are, am I only preaching about limitations or am I preaching about possibilities? Am I using derogatory illustrations about people, people's bodies, people's language, people's ethnicity, people's melanin count? Am I preaching derogatory illustrations or am I filtering my illustrations so they are still giving life to what's going on? Is it just my theology or do I recognize that everybody has a theology? Everybody has a God talk. Or is it just mine and you're going to listen to this because I got the power? It's that kind of thing. Um, am I aware of who, with whom I am preaching? Um, we talked a little bit about reading the room last night. Am I aware who's sitting in the room? Am I aware of the people that I'm supposed to be pastoring? Am I aware, even when I visit, I ask questions about who's in the congregation. So I'm not preaching something they have, that has no connection with who they are. So with whom am I preaching? Um, or I'll just come in cold and you're gonna to listen to it no matter what. Um, moving beyond condemning people to naming and confronting the power that's in the way and trying not to do a stereotypic all of y'all statement about it. Those people, them, they. But remember I said we have to talk about complicity. So what is it that we are doing together? What is it that we need to address as we're going forward becomes important. And I see that I'm not going to have time to finish everything I want to. Okay. I may come back to this, but... Um, here we go. If we're going to preach transformatively, uh, if we're going to proclaim a witness transformatively, we have to have courage uh, because when one speaks truth to power, people are not going to like it. Uh, we stand with the people, but it's going to make people uncomfortable. And that old trite expression of, uh, trying to irritate the comfortable and comfort those that are irritated, something of that nature. But, but I talked about imagination last night. When you are going to preach a hard topic, there's a lot of vulnerability, but you have to understand who you're preaching with, not just the people in front of you, but the people that are now gonna hear about it. And I said last night, we we're talking about posting everything. The sermon never ends. So you may be preaching this context, but they're going to take it someplace else. And before you know it, somebody that you don't even know has heard you say something and said, why'd you say that? So this is why you have to be able to stand on every word that you say, right? But it takes courage to do these kinds of things. So we preach these hard topics that I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, start reading. When you read the text, you may want to, you can't, if you're going to preach a prophetic sermon, it doesn't just happen, as I said, in one sermon. You may have to do a Bible study ahead of time. You may have to have a discussion group about something about it. You may have to have a space where you can answer questions when you finish it. If you're using pictures or something of that nature, there may be some trigger warnings going out if you're going to talk about a particular subject. You may have to have somebody come in that's going to do some pastoral counseling when you finish preaching a hard topic with someone. We need to know those kinds of things because when we start talking about prophetic voice and we talk about isms, an ism is about power. That's all it is. It's about power. It's about discriminatory behavior. It's about a belief of power over someone. But everything, as I, I said I was going to tell you today, is interconnected. 
everything's interconnected. Most of the time, when we talk about prophetic preaching or transformative preaching, people think we're going to talk about sex, we're going to talk about uh, alcohol, we're going to talk about race, alcohol and drugs and race. And they can't say anything past that. But what I want to share with you, when we talk about isms and power over, there's so many other ways you can approach topics and talk about the same need for us to be equal, for us to respect each other, for us to love each other, for us to care for the beloved community. So some of the topics that one can preach or teach about, medical testing and access, surrogacy and cloning, surrogacy is in the biblical text. And trust me, I've done enough research. Everything I'm going to tell you is in the biblical text someplace. The language changed, but you can find it. Mental health treatment. More than, more than just the, the young man that's in the, uh, in the New Testament that had the legion, right? There, there are kings in the Old Testament. They're scratching, scratching the doors of the temple and, and growing in beers. And, and David even played like he had a mental health issue, right? But what is that? Euthanasia and life. Particularly in Black church, we don't talk a lot about what euthanasia means or end of life treatment. And it's very hard when I teach classes on funerals for people to even articulate the word death. So when do we do that other than funerals? When do we talk about these kinds of things? When do we talk about racial profiling and policing? I think there was some profiling going on in the biblical text at some juncture because I think Jesus and the crew had to leave because you know they were in a certain kind of group there, but it's in the book. Voting rights and enfranchisement, technological apartheid is very important. And please remember at one time a wheel was technology, a pen was technology, but who, who is it that does not have access to things that makes their life easier and why is that there? Verbal, I call it linguistic lynching, but James talks about the tongue, as I said last night, being a mighty member, how do we stay in community with each other when we find all these vicious ways to refer to each other. And then it is on television, particularly on the weekend, all these housewives of this and the best of this and all, there's so much competition that we begin to believe the only way we can be in relationship is calling each other names and defaming each other's uh, heritage. Talk about that. Bullying, elder abuse, child abuse, sexual harassment, Immigration reform. Immigration, even though we, the last few years, we think that it just started, it's all throughout the biblical text because everybody was itinerant and sojourning someplace else. Immigration is in the biblical text. Just war theory is there also. God sends people to wipe folks out. War is in the Bible. Human rights are there. Sensing guidelines and jet, the, excuse me, drug policies. Gentrification is in the promised land narrative. Somebody was living there before the, before the children of Israel showed up. What happened to them? That's gentrification. Just thought I'd let y'all know that. Good sermon. Make sure you tell your people you're gonna preach out the box that Sunday when you preach that. Affluenza and conspicuous consumption is there. We sometimes act like if somebody, Jesus didn't say that everybody had to be poor. It's what you do with your money that becomes important. Right. I mean, his daddy was a carpenter. That means he was a skilled tradesman. So it's, it's what we do with what we have, not just during stewardship month, but I love shoes. I admit my complicity in that I will buy a pair of shoes. I will go without food to get a pair of shoes, not red bottoms, but a pair of shoes. And there's some things I don't need. So what do I do? Every six months, I purge my closet give some things away to people, not stuff that's worn out, falling apart, but things that still have some use. So what is it about affluenza? Sex trafficking, prop, prostitution, and rape culture is all throughout the Old Testament. There's a whole thing about the woman that got chopped up and sent in all those different kinds of ways. All that stuff is in there. There were families that ignored the rape of the woman, Tamar. Look at all those things. That's in the book. I'm in Atlanta, which is the center of sex trafficking in the world. So I think that it would be heinous for a preacher here not to ever discuss that, okay? Educational disparity, body consciousness. Body consciousness gets us in so many problems, but there, there are things in the biblical text about the body. Houselessness or homelessness and deficient housing needs to be talked about. 
Now, I'm going to go over real quick a couple of things that I think I have maybe five minutes to do this. Uh, some areas when one is going to do, so you don't always have to talk about race and sex as a way to be prophetic and defame somebody. Ageism is, affects everybody in your congregation. It's a systematic oppression, yes, of older people, but it also is the way that we articulate younger people. It means we make people disposable. It's the way we call their names. It's the talking about their bodies. It's, it's poverty. It's the what fullness of life looks like. Ageism or marginalization. I think there's something in the Old Testament about there was somebody that was bald and some boys said something to them and then they got in trouble about it because he called him out of his name because he was older. What are our cultural concepts around aging? Right. I, I think that we, we tend to rely too much on sociological studies, nothing against sociologists, but we don't look at who they're studying. It is the, uh, the Pew Foundation study of millennials. And, we, and Black churches picked up and started talking about we're doing this to millennials. But I also want you to know that the first study that Pew did on millennials did not include any Black people. They said they couldn't find any because I asked them. But anyway, uh, make sure you get all the information together. Ableism. Uh, the word changes depending on who's saying it, but we have to educate ourselves. And because we're living longer and living differently, and particularly coming out of COVID when people of all different ages are now having all these side effects, how do we talk about responsibilities and complicity and oppression of persons who are body different. The limitations, the visibility and the, and the invisibility of people. How are we looking at that? Uh, I gotta, I'm not gonna be able to do all these. We'll, let me go past this one. Uh, classism is another area that one can be talking about and the disparities of class the economic stratification, uh, even within your community. What does that look like? What are the social distinctions? Where is there a glass ceiling? And I say that we usually have brick ceilings. What are intellectual assumptions about people in certain classes? Right. I always find it very interesting when there, there are people in seminary who were making a certain salary before they came to seminary. Now all of a sudden they have to live like people that didn't have that salary. And they are the saddest people in the world, people that go to seminary, they give up a job to work for Christ. Yes. And they usually think they're going to go out and make big money the first year. That's not happening either. But, but how do you, how do you uh, stand in the shoes of someone that you didn't think you'd have to be there, right? Um, what are the family considerations of uh, configurations and how do we talk about that? What is the land distribution in terms of class? What is the health and nutrition in terms of class? My point being, that if one's going to have a transformative voice, it is never just one topic that we're talking about. It is a blend of things that are coming together. And so you don't have to pigeonhole yourself. Always when you get up, people are gonna say, oh no, here they come again. They're getting ready to talk about race. No, we don't have to do that at all. There are ways for us to talk about so many other things that affect so many people and still have more that we can preach about. And all of this, because I require this in my classes, every topic that you can imagine, you can find a biblical text that has talked about it in different language. Being transformative, look at, our, look at ourselves in the mirror, evaluate ourselves, and try not to kill people with our words while we're supposed to be talking about freedom. So I'll stop there because I went too long and I'm supposed to stop down and take questions. Whew, 40 minutes. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Awesome presentation. Uh, we're going to open up the floor now to any questions that you may have for our guest lecturer. Uh, we do ask that you place those questions in the chat um, and I can read them out um, so that she will be able to answer um, for us this morning. I know y'all have some questions, didn't see too many. Now, while we're waiting for you to place those questions in the chat, uh, Mr. Everett, you may be able to answer this. I did get a message. Uh, will this, I know we are recording this, will that be dispersed out to students to come back and to review later? Yes, yes, it'll be It'll be on the uh, website. So everybody be, we have, have access to it. Okay, yes. thank you. 
Yeah, no problem. Both 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 sessions yesterday as well as today for sure. Absolutely. What questions do we have? I don't see any just yet. All right, so I do see one question. Okay. The question is, what is the sermon you preach that got you in the most trouble? <laughs> yeah, every one I've ever done. Uh, let's see. I think early on in ministry, I preached a sermon about Samson and Delilah. And I talked about Samson's responsibility for drinking and going to sleep. And why did we always blame Delilah for it? So it was about taking responsibility for our actions. And so that one was quite, uh, that one was quite interesting. But that was a long time ago when I was a child, I speak as a child, but I still <laughs> believe that. But <laughs> I still believe that. But that got me in the most trouble. Other than that, I think because I preach uh, in all different kinds of contexts, there are times when I might, uh, like in our chapel or something, I've, I've done some things about justice fatigue, but I talked about uh, the caged bird singing. Uh, and there were some people that were uncomfortable with me talking about our responsibilities to stop um, keeping people out of the will of God. Uh, so that got me in a little bit of trouble too. Um, how do we address oppressive structures within our own denominational tradition? This is an excellent question because I've done this. I'm, I'm an outlier in my denomination. Dr. Grant will tell you this. Uh, I believe that first I have to preach what God says for me to preach because in the, in the parlance of the Baptists that I grew up with, they don't have a heaven or hell to put me in. And so when I, when I see something that is oppressive, I speak out against it. I'm chairing the sexual ethics discernment committee. I'm one of the three chairs in our denomination where we're going to talk about um, our perceptions of sexuality and what does that mean? And so people know, now let me put it this way. I am an academic dean at a research one university. God made it so. When I wanted to start a church, they told me no. So I'm there. I have a job that pays me and my insurance. So I have a voice because the church can't hurt me. So what I was taught early on is if someone does not have a space that they can speak to get with someone that can. not And so when I was going through the process, I had men and women that would speak for me. So what I do now is I'm able to speak because I'm not threatened by being fired. I'm not threatened by being put out. And I'm really not scared of anybody but Jesus. But, uh, but that's what happens when you live a little bit longer. Uh, and so even within the, I think that for me, there are people that want to be outside of the denomination and talk. I think that it makes more sense for me to be inside the denomination and let's talk about these things because I know the context and I know the people and everybody's not going to listen, but there are people that don't have voice that will listen. And that's the way to get some things done. But I work better on the inside. And it's painful. There, I always tell people there are consequences for speaking truth to power. And you have to develop, uh, the old language I think was you had to develop a thick skin. I just know that just because I have an opinion doesn't mean it's the right, it, it's the only opinion. So I also have to be open to hear other people tell me why not. So I'm, people in my denomination know that I, I believe in the humanity of everybody. And so if there are members of my congregation that think, uh, of the denomination that thinks that gays and lesbians, LGBTQIA plus people need to go to hell, that's on them. I don't, I don't feel that way, but I can still be part of the denomination because there are other places where I have a hook. So that's what, I, that's what I've been able to do. But the consequences are sometimes you're not put on committees and you're not giving assignments, but it's okay, I have a house that I can come to and other places I can preach because I'm not assigned to a denomination, I just happen to be affiliated with one. Um, what does it mean that authentic preaching can only take place when the preacher is either not dependent on the church or outside the church? I think that authentic preaching can, can take place within a church. To me, authentic preaching is being yourself and being speaking your own voice. And again, the consequences are going to come, but I don't think you have to leave a church altogether to be authentic. I think that we've been taught to play dress up 
uh, from the time some of us go into the church, we think that we have to dress a certain way and we have to talk a certain way and we have to raise our leg and hoop a certain way. And if we don't, we're not there. But, but it's in my head, it's who called you to preach in the first place. And the church didn't call you to preach and the denomination didn't call you to preach and they didn't give birth to you. So being assured enough in yourself to be who you are, wherever you are, becomes critically important, I think. But that's just what has worked for me. It may not work for everybody, but it worked for me even before I started teaching. That my call was to teach, preach, and write, not to pastor. And at the time, the only label that they gave to people that would answer the call was to pastor. But God told me very clearly to teach, preach, and write. That's what I've done. God has moved things around for me to be able to do that. Uh, so that's that's what what happens there. Um, what's that? Okay, uh, cross racial context is coming up again. Uh, what what I what um, one has to develop a model of what to do with all the pain that comes in cross racial appointments. And to understand that transformative uh, preaching is not accusatory all the time. Uh, I think that's where we, we get off kilter because we think that if somebody's going to come in and talk about one of the subjects that we're going to say, you're the one that's wrong. And I think the conversation has to begin when I said your own complicity has to begin with what have we done thus far? You have injured me. I'm feeling injured. I've injured other people. Now let's talk about what this is all about. And understanding that some people are not going to budge from their own position on any of the subject matter that I have there. And these the, the, the cross-racial appointments have, have similar difficulties with uh, women pastoring predominantly female congregations, believe it or not with people going in different parts of the country, moving from you grew up in, in Alabama, now you're preaching in New York. There's this cultural kind of thing that has to be talked through and it doesn't always work, but I've seen some cross-racial appointments. So one of my daughters in ministry is a, is a bishop of the United Methodist Church, Latrell Miller Easterling. And she grew up in Indianapolis, but lived everywhere. But she is gets some kind of hits every now and then because People are afraid to hear her voice because of who she is and what she represents. And so it's a difficult kind of piece, but I think you have to go congregation by congregation, group of people by groups of people as to how you work out any kind of transformation in those settings. Um, I'm not in a cross-racial appointment, but I'm in an administration that doesn't have a lot of people that look like me. And we have to have come to Jesus meetings once a week. Just have to say, hey, you do things this way, I do things this way, now let's talk. And sometimes the feelings are hurt, sometimes there's a break in the understanding, but it doesn't happen. I don't think there's any fairy dust we can put on any of these things to make them work really well at all. Um, I think there's another one I missed, but Reverend Gansey, can you help me? I don't think I saw all the questions. I don't see there any other. Someone was asking um, about uh, receiving both presentations, and yes, that will be um, provided. I do have a question. Um, what advice would you give for those of us who are young clergy and just kind of beginning the ministerial journey? Be yourself. I think that we forget that God calls us as individuals because God knows what we have and what God has placed in us. But too, too many, I talked about clones last night, the, 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 the social pressure to be like everybody else is what kills ministries. The social pressure to sound like everybody else when it could be such a beautiful array of types of sermons and, and ways people position themselves. But then we have these dress codes and we have this seating charts and all this other kind of stuff. And just listen to who God has told you to be and where you're supposed to be. And remember that you're being sent to a people who have been listening to one voice for a long time. And it may not be they reject your voice, they just have to get used to your voice and the way that you've done things. And you are also, particularly 
persons who are entering ministry now that may be in their thirties or forties uh, and some in their late twenties. Um, you have to please God first. You're not there to entertain the masses. You're not there for, for hits. You're not there to build a large brand. You are there to understand who the people are and be in a, and, and my father in ministry used to say, always keep yourself in a position to do ministry, which means you cannot party with the people on Saturday night and expect them to listen to you on Sunday morning. You just can't do it. There has to be some kind of line. And I know in some denominations, everybody's on a first name basis. But think about when you really need someone, how much trust you put in a person that you were just ingesting gummies with. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's not just for young people. That's like the people that, you know, they just been out for cocktails and I'm gonna tell you something, right? So there has to be some line. It doesn't mean you have to be an ascetic kind of person, but it means there has to be some kind of boundary that I can trust what you are, <laughs> that I can trust what you are now doing, okay? That I, can, follow, that I can give my information to you. I'm sorry. A follow-up question to that. Someone uh, asks, how difficult have you found it to remain authentic? So I know you were mentioning about the be yourself, but how difficult have you found it to remain? The first five years, it was hard for me. But the last 35, God just said, that's not who I called you to be. I didn't call you when they were telling me that the only way I could get places, I, I've had gray hair since I was five, is to dye my hair or to wear my hair straight, or to put on a wig, or to wear St. John, or something like that, or stand a certain way. My father in ministry said I couldn't sing, and I used to be a choir director. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do all those things they told me because I would look like a preacher. And I had a friend that said, the real ones never do. And so it was like, I have to be who Teresa is because it was, I was playing, like I was five, playing dress up. So I had to do me, and what I found was my creativity came back my, yeah, I didn't get invited everywhere. I'm not in a group. I'm not in a circuit. But God expanded my ministry because God called me to do stuff as Teresa, not to do stuff as somebody next door. And I couldn't preach like a man because that's not me. And, I, and I, I, I'm not a hooper, but I've had a productive preaching career, right? Uh, I want people to think. I want people to think. I don't give lectures when I'm in a pulpit, but I want people to think for themselves because I don't have all the answers. And I think that's what has kept me. And, and I have people around me that keep me humble that tell me, you know, that mm -mm, that's not you, right? So you have to have somebody that you trust enough to tell you the truth and say, you know, you really, that what you flunked that one. Uh, and it keeps me doing what I need to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Let's show our guest lecturer some virtual love. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, for coming and being a part of this uh, series. Uh, we were so uh, honored to have you with us. Um, at this time, we are now uh, wrapping up. Mr. Everett, I believe, um, is raising his hand. And then, Dr. Epperheimer, if you have anything, um, please share with us as well. Thank you all. No, it's on, it's on a dean or either, either a Dr. Burrow. So, dean, your problem? Oh, um, well, well, thank you, Mr. Everett, and, and thank you, uh, Reverend Gansey, for uh, uh, presiding this morning, and thank you, Dr. Barrow, for doing the honors last night. And, of course, thank you to Dr. Fry Brown for two empowering, inspirational lectures. Boy, you have given us all lots to think about, lots to take with us on the journey. And, you know, as a dean and as a scholar and a teacher, you are very busy and we are just so honored that you took time out of your busy schedule to uh, spend time with us, to share your wisdom with us. Uh, what a gift, what a gift. Um, and uh, you can count on us at Hood Theological Seminary when we say that the check is in the mail because the check is in the mail. It, it is on our way and it's just a small token of our appreciation for sharing your gifts with us so on behalf of the community thank you very much boy it, what a blessing thank you all very much all right so um if you have a, a class coming up uh, i guess it's time to log off and and get prepared to to 
do some more learning and do some more thinking. So Dr. Brown, uh, you always uh, have a you always have a special place in our heart at Hood Theological Seminary. So thanks again. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it very much.